begin by singing coming down, 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 coming down, down.
210. 210, I'd rather have Jesus. Number 210. <laughs>
before. So we thank and praise the Lord for His goodness. And one thing for sure, that means we can look forward to tomorrow because that will be, once again, another better and sweeter day. Let's pray together this evening. Dear Lord Jesus, we are blessed to be in your presence. And I'm so thankful, dear Lord God, that we have this opportunity and once again to come and meet with you. Lord Jesus, tonight we are gathered together and we have the strength to be here. We have the opportunity to be here. Lord, you have brought us out. And for that, we once again are thankful and grateful. We want to remember, dear Lord Jesus, any that are not with us this evening. And Lord God, any that we haven't seen perhaps all day. Lord God, we ask that you would intervene in whatever is taking place in their lives that has caused them to miss this opportunity. And we pray, dear Lord Jesus, that you will touch them, body, soul, and spirit. And while we are here this evening, Lord, we now look to the Word. And I pray, dear Lord Jesus, that once again you would open our hearts and our minds to receive what the Spirit has for us. Help us, dear Lord Jesus, to examine ourselves as we saw and heard and was read to us in the communion service this morning. Lord God, how important it is that we are truthful, stand humbly before Thee, so that You can move and You can work on us. Everyone, Lord Jesus, I believe, needs You to work on them. And so, God, tonight, touch us by Your Spirit, through the Word, with Your anointing, so that we will leave here refreshed and encouraged and with something new, something, dear Lord God, for us to ponder, something, dear Lord Jesus, for us to pray about. I ask in thy name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Perhaps you have had um, the circumstance, something similar to what I'm about to describe. You are uh, gone someplace with someone, um, and uh, there's a decision that needs to be made. And unfortunately, you don't both have the same thought as to what should take place, uh, let's say, within the next hour. And one of you would like to perhaps go to one location and spend time looking at something, and the other, well, you want to go somewhere else. And uh, you would rather spend time doing something perhaps completely the opposite. You may find yourselves in a situation where compromise is necessary. And uh, this evening we're going to speak and look at what the scripture tells us with regards to compromise and what are actually the dangers with regards to compromise when it comes to spiritual things, when it comes to our walk and our talk with the Lord. In the example that I gave you to start off with, um, somebody, well, actually, if it's a true compromise, both people are going to lose something. And that, in effect, is what compromise means. Compromise means that you give up something that you wanted, and the other person also gives up something that they wanted. True compromise means that it happens for both individuals or both organizations, whatever parties happen to be. And I, in the natural, there's, I would suppose, and I would agree, that there is a place for compromise. So in the situation that I sort of uh, started with here, perhaps you decide that, okay, we'll take the hour and we'll split it in two, and for half an hour we'll go where you wanted to go, and for the other half hour we'll go where I want to go. And so we'll both see a little bit of what we wanted to see. We won't both get what we wanted. Both parties will struggle with regards to having to let go of something. The world is big on compromise. God is not. And if I were to sit down now, you've got the crux of the message. God is not, with regards to his people, with regards to the lifestyles that he tells us we should live, with regards to his commandments, with regards to his statutes, all of these things, God does not say there is any room for compromise. And you've heard me say uh, in the past, and I stand upon this thought, that there are definitely things within God's Word 
where there is no negotiation whatsoever. None. Okay. You either take the Lord's word as it is, and you say that you are one of his children and you follow him, or you don't. And that, of course, God says everybody has an opportunity to make a decision. We all have decisions we make all the time. In the natural, in the world, you might make a decision not to compromise. You might be standing there with your son or daughter or with your spouse, and you might say, no, we're going to spend the next hour doing what I say. I don't know how well that'll work. There might be a payday for that somewhere down the line. Because you may end up in a big argument, because the other person may rightfully so also say, no, I'm not going to do what you want. We're going to do what I would like to do. Again, in that particular case, um, it's likely in the natural both people will lose. But when we don't compromise with what the Lord tells us to do, the only loser is Satan. The only losers are those that do not abide with what God says. God's people will not lose and will not suffer if we follow what the Lord tells us to do. So, as Christians today, we have this challenge because all around us, the buzzword, so to speak, is compromise, right? I mean, there's negotiation happening everywhere. It's been going on for a long time. I remember when I was a principal, I went to special courses on how to be a moderator, how to be a negotiator, how to help people to compromise when there was conflict. And I regret to say that much of my job was dealing with conflict. Most often, parents came into my office, not because they were overly pleased, although I did have a few people like that, but most of the time they wanted something. And it wasn't always something that I could give. So it was often a give and take, an adjustment, but there were times when I had to say no. That's not something that is going to change. And then, of course, there are threats afterwards and those kind of things. And you see, for God's people today, Satan, really, I believe, using the same kind of tactics, will come into your life, will sometimes come into a congregation, will come into a community, will come into a nation, will try and adjust laws and different things like that, demanding that certain things be given, certain things stop happening. And as God's people, we have to have a backbone. We have to have courage that God gives us, right? Because the enemy can be fierce if we don't have the Lord with us. And we have to be prepared to say, come what may, I'm not going to change. Because it's not my right as a Christian to change what God has said. See, in the end, it kind of comes down to that, doesn't it? Right? I mean... I don't have the right, as an ambassador of Christ, to negotiate away or to compromise on anything that my master has put in place. No person here has the right to do that, because that is not within our control. Our duty, our job, if you want to look at it that way, or responsibility, is to adhere to what the Lord tells us to do. My title this evening is The Danger of Compromise. Because as a Christian, there's no way you can win when you compromise. Because remember what I said, the basic definition of compromising, so if we talk now about compromising our faith, or compromising on what the Bible teaches us, with regards to behaviors or lifestyle or any of those kind of things, the definition of compromise is giving away something that you believe in, something that you want, something that you are in agreement with. Right? And when I stopped and I considered that, often a compromise leads to a situation where people end up convincing themselves that it's good enough. So the two people that I started off with are very simple, you're, you're right, sort of example. You know, 
the one person, if they decide that it's going to be half an hour, half an hour, if that is a, a agreed upon decision, then really both of them are saying, well, I guess half an hour doing what I wanted to do is good enough. So that led me to this question that we would have to ask ourselves or look to the Lord and we would have to say, is there anything that is, quote, good enough for God? In the sense that we can take it away and God will still be satisfied, right? It would be like saying, well, following eight out of the Ten Commandments is good enough. Is it? Because as soon as you say that, you're open to further compromise. Well, if eight out of ten commandments is good enough, then why isn't seven out of ten commandments good enough? You see, the enemy always wants to shift the standard, wants to change the rule, wants to change what God has said. And let's face it, Satan is always looking out for himself, right? He's never going to negotiate with you or try and convince you to do something that hurts him. It may look good on the surface, and you might think, oh, I won this time. But that's never the case, right? The only way we win is with sticking with what the Lord says. So let's just get a sense uh, from the scripture about how God feels with regards to compromise and why this is so dangerous, and we'll sort of work our way towards that. I want to start in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 7. There are a number of places here in the scripture where uh, we could pull from God's instruction to his people. And it's very similar, and you know, I touched on this in Sunday school this morning, and I've spoken about this in the past with regards to how specific God is, right? When we were looking at the tabernacle this morning, there was nothing really that the Lord left to chance. He said how big it was supposed to be, where it was supposed to be, what it was supposed to look like, how it was supposed to stand, how big the door was supposed to be, the colors it was supposed to be, where the interior decorations were supposed to be, etc. Right? He was very, very specific. And so throughout the scripture, God is specific. And with regards to the children of Israel, he was very clear, and they may not have understood it at the time, and we might look at it today and even still not quite understand, but God always knows what's best, right? And we know the children of Israel, like a wave, follow the Lord and then dropped away from him, and follow the Lord and dropped away, and returned to him and dropped away. All right, in a cycle that unfortunately we see repeated often. And the falling away piece happened, I believe, every time because of some element of compromise. Some piece where the children of Israel or God's children today decide that they can give away part of what God tells us to do and it's still going to be good enough. But they are in fact trading away a piece of what the Lord says we should be doing. Okay? Or they're doing something as a result that God says don't do. Okay? So here we're just going to read about God's warnings <coughs> against disobedience. It says at the top of my Bible. And we're talking about the interaction between God's people and the neighboring nations, okay? And so, um, I'll pick this up in chapter 7 of Deuteronomy, let's go to verse 2. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them, speaking of all the different uh, nations that are listed in verse 1, uh, deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them, thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Okay, so right away we see a situation in this particular case where God says there's no compromise. Okay? We're, we're not showing mercy to these people. Nothing. 
Okay, we are going to, as he says, I want you to utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them. That's an important thing, right? We look at a covenant today, it's really a holy contract in a sense. It's, it's a, very, uh, a very important act, right? And so to make a contract today, often there is a negotiation involved. And, and so God is saying here, you're not going to negotiate which means there's not going to be any compromise, right? Verse 3, Neither shalt thou make marriages with them, thy daughters. Daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. So verse 4 really, in a nutshell, tells us what is the danger of compromise. And you see, when we, and you, you need to pray and meditate about this, right? Because when you read that, I guess the first question that sometimes comes to mind, right, is, well, how come the sun will be turned away from God to follow the other gods, why isn't it the other way around? And I think that's a valid question, okay? But I think, personally, the anger lies within the fact that as soon as a, as a child of God is willing to give away anything, all right, and take on anything that's ungodly, right, that's when we forsake the Lord. The hedge drops away. The protection of the Lord isn't there anymore. See, God has a really, really high standard. We have to remember that. God's standard is higher than any other standard you can think of. And by the way, it's higher than, if the devil had a standard, it's much, 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 much higher than Satan's standard. See, Satan is willing to take a little bit at a time. God wants it all. Now, you might say, well, that's selfish, isn't it? Or that's so demanding. God is demanding. And it's part of why we have to confess we can't do this without Him. Right? If the Lord's standard was less than perfect, it would result in more and more people saying they can achieve it on their own. And then it results in people giving glory to themselves. Okay? But God says, no, you can't do this on your own. You must not turn away from me even a little bit. Because as soon as you do that, this kind of links a little bit to a previous service where I talked about Satan getting a foothold, you know, getting his foot in the door. Right? Once his foot is in the door, you're in tr there's danger. Okay? You're in trouble. And so we don't want to even let that happen. So God understood that here, and he understood that his children needed him 100%, and they could not take on anything that was contrary. Okay? And then, so he says in verse 5, But thus shall ye deal with them, ye shall destroy their altars, break down their images, cut down their groves, burn their graven images with fire, for thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. See, so God here, he, he explains why. Why, are, why do we have to do this? Because thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God, the Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, unto himself, notice, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because ye are more in number than any people, for ye were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So, pretty obvious here from this example, and there are others, 
that when God says no, he means no all the time. He doesn't mean, uh, you can take some liberties here or liberties there and 80% is good enough. No, he was very clear here about what was supposed to happen and what was not supposed to happen, right? Now, people make their own choices. That's, of course, what we see happening over and over again in the scripture. And the result of that isn't pretty. It's not good. Okay? And so we have to ask the Lord to help us to make good choices. Because God is about instruction. And if you go to Psalm 32... <coughs> verse 8. Psalm 32 and verse 8. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with my eye. That requires trust. That requires faith, right? Because we have to believe in our heart and mind that God knows better than we do. Otherwise, don't bother going to Him for instruction. Right? Why would you go to somebody for instruction if you think you already know how to do it? Are you following? Right? I mean, you know, the idea with having a teacher is the teacher is supposed to know how something works and then is going to share that knowledge for the benefit of the child or the other adult so that they too can then be successful, right? We don't teach people to be unsuccessful. The idea is to teach people so they can be successful. So when the Lord says, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go, he's again demonstrating to you and to I, to me, that his way is the best way. Right? Because that's coming from God. If that comes from me and I tell you, here, I'll teach you how, well, you kind of can take that one way or the other because I'm a person who makes mistakes just like anybody else. Right? And technology can change and knowledge can change, you know, and people can learn how to do things better. But remember, none of that applies to God. Like, is there anybody who can help God get better? No. He's as good as it gets. He's perfect, right? He's almighty, he's omnipotent. See, all of these things, they wrap themselves together. Right? You have to keep reminding, I at least, have to keep reminding myself of all of these things about who God is. So when God says, I will teach you, you're being taught, we're being taught from the very, very, very best. There's no one who has more knowledge, who has more understanding than God has. So when God told the children of Israel in Deuteronomy what they should do, he had a good reason for it. Now today people would say, well, that was cruel, and that was not, you know, you don't do that, and we want to take them in, and we want to compromise, and we want to do all those. Those are natural human emotions. And there's a place for that, if God says so. But in this particular case, he said no. 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 Okay. Now Jesus teaches a further step. You know, he talks much more about mercy. And he talks much more about turning the other cheek and treating your enemies, you know, in different... Uh, the, the, the teaching of the Lord um, grows, in a sense, as we see going through the scripture, right? But in this particular case, you know, when we're looking at Deuteronomy, it was very clear. There's no compromise there, right? And Jesus doesn't say compromise either. Because we have to always stay true to what the Lord is teaching us. Not to what man wants to teach us. James chapter 4. If 
we look at this verse in James 4, I'm looking at verse 17. What does it say? It says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Now, that's an interesting verse if you contemplate and you consider how does that fit in with the idea of compromise. You see, when we compromise our own sort of standard or what we have accepted as God's standard within us, we're hurting ourselves, right? So when the Lord says here, therefore to him that knoweth to do good, so that's the standard, right? Let's say that's, that's the perfect thing, but doeth it not. See, that person has compromised. They've given away something that they know is right. And what does the Bible say? To him, it is sin. Hmm. I could extend, therefore, and I could, I believe, say that when we compromise on what the Lord teaches us, we're sinning. Because anything that goes against the Lord's will is sin. See, compromising on God's standards is serious, serious, serious business. And when we see quote-unquote Christians today or denominations, organizations, families, I, I don't mean to pick on anybody in particular, anyone who says they're a Christian, but then they live a lifestyle that's contrary to what God says, they know what's right, they know what's good, they've decided not to do that, and the Bible says, to him it is sin. What happens to sinners? Where does a sinner spend eternity? It's pretty serious, right? You know? And, and, you know, and then people will say, well, God will overlook it. God is a God of mercy. God is a God of love. You know, I like to throw those things out. But God is not a God of compromise. He's not. And that means, to be really blunt, I need his help every day. Because <laughs> that is a really, really high standard, right? And that is something that only the Lord can really help us with. That. See, my example, as I sort of wrap this up a little bit, at the beginning I talked about there was an hour of time and two people, and they decide, well, we'll do half an hour what you want and half an hour what I want. Okay. And we'll both be happy, not as happy as we would have been, but we'll both we'll, we'll say it was good enough. Okay? In that particular example, which I suppose might be ideal if you want to compromise, they split the time in two. There are other ways that compromise works, right? I might say to that other person, okay, no problem, I'll give you five minutes. We'll spend 55 minutes doing what I want. And you can have five minutes doing what you want. That's still a compromise. Not a great one for the person that lost all that time, right? That only gets five minutes. But that's still compromise. What I'm wanting to just sort of close as we close on this, sometimes we think compromise is really, it has to be really big issues, right? Or it has to be really obvious. And that's not necessarily the case. See, the devil actually functions in a way where he comes in in a sneaky way, right? He comes in little by little. And little by little are those little compromises that God's people kind of get used to. But the little by little gets bigger and bigger. Let me give you an example that's happening right now in the sanctuary. Okay. Doesn't involve any people. It's safe. Don't worry. See these lights? They have certain bulbs in them, which we can't get anymore. At least not in Canada, we don't think. Right? And people like most people like this kind of a, you know, this warm, I guess you call this a warm color, right? It's kind of a 
goldy, yellowy kind of a color. It's not too harsh or anything like that, right? Well, we can't really get those too much anymore, right? And if you swivel your head, right, up on the balcony up there, those lights are bright white lights, okay? And we tried those down here, and people weren't too happy with them, you know, and, and so, okay, no problem. In a sense, we, that was a compromise. Okay, well, we have to put something up there, so we'll put them up there. Nobody's kind of looking that way most of the time, so they shouldn't bother you too much there. Well, so then we had bulbs start to go out here. Now what are we going to do? Okay. In amidst these bulbs here, and I haven't counted them, but the ones hanging, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 18, 18 of them, there are three that are not like the others. So later you can start looking. Which ones? Which ones? Which ones are not the same? Okay? They're only a little bit different. But, you see, over time, and unless I pointed it out, most people would not notice. Because it's close to the original, it's not quite the same. You know what? It'll be good enough. Most people won't know and won't see. And slowly over time, as the other ones burn out, more and more of the new bulbs will come in place, right? Until they're all new ones. And there won't be any of the old ones left. That's one of the dangers of compromise. See, we really like these bulbs, but we can't find them anymore. So the other ones are good enough. They're close. So we make a compromise. We'll put those in instead. Okay. Most people won't notice. But over time, we'll just keep increasing until, and here's my point, right? In the end, if you get into compromise, you won't have any of the original left. It'll all be diluted. It'll all be whatever people have compromised it, you see? And Christianity today, sad to say, my personal feeling, much of it, most that you look around isn't like what God intended it to be anymore. Right? Over centuries, over time, we'll compromise on this, and then we'll compromise on that, oh, maybe we'll adjust this, we'll do a little bit here, we'll do a little bit there, until the original, you can't even recognize it anymore. That's the danger of compromise. Because when we don't recognize it anymore, we're functioning in a sinful state. And when the time comes that we stand before the judgment, we're going to be in trouble if that's the case. I want to leave you with one last section of scripture. And you will find that in 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 22, as I close. Because here in 2 Kings chapter 22, a section and an event that most of us are familiar with or I can quickly remind you of. We're talking about here Hil Hilkiah the priest, right? And as they are rebuilding the temple, they find something. They find something that was lost. The word of the law, the book of the law, the Bible as it was in that time, okay? It had been put away somewhere who knows where, right? But as it was, as it disappeared, they were still, they still thought they were serving God. They still thought they were following God's rules. But really what they were following was man-made compromises. Because they didn't have the original anymore. Okay? So the greatest danger of compromise is you lose everything. And you get second best, third best, fourth best, whatever. But you don't get what really is needed. Okay? So here, if I just do this very quickly, in uh, 2 Kings chapter 22, right? So let's start here at verse 9. 2 Kings 22, oh, verse 8. Uh, and Hilkiah the high priest said unto uh, Shaphan the scribe, 
I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. And Shaphan the scribe came to the king and brought the king word again and said, Thy servants have gathered the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hands of them that do the work, that have the oversight of the house of the Lord. And Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the high priest hath delivered me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. And it came to pass, when the king had heard the words of the book of the law, that he rent his clothes. In other words, he was in distress. He couldn't believe it. What? We weren't doing what God had told us to do? How did that happen? Compromise. Little by little by little. I believe it happens through compromise. All right? And the king commanded Hilkiah the priest and uh, Ahikam the son of Shaphan and Achbor the son of Machai, something like that, and Shaphan the scribe and Asiah, a servant of the king, saying, Go ye, inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judah concerning the words of this book that is found. For great is, and this is important to see this, for great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this book to do according unto all that which is written concerning us. You see, somewhere in the back, over time, they didn't hearken to the book. And for the purposes of this message, I'm saying that's compromise. Right? They decided. We don't have to do what God said here. Eh, that's old stuff. That's for a long time ago. That's for, who knows, we're modern now. We're sophisticated now. We're smarter now. Whatever word you want to use. They gave some reason. Usually when we compromise, we have a good reason, we think. Right? But if we are compromising on God's word and what God wants us to do, no reason is good enough. None. Now, you know, I'll stand before you honestly, because I'm like you, there are times when I might want to compromise, because my heart is pulling and my brain is saying whatever, right? But if we are looking at it purely as God intended it, there is no compromise with regards to the word of the Lord. Okay? Because the end result is it will all be gone. And people will be following something that they think is scripture, but it's not anywhere close. And the only way to fix that is to get back to the original. Right? To get back to the original. Let's say, as I close, and you keep that in mind, that over time, all the lights get changed. Two, one, two, three, uh, I think it's the fourth one. Yeah, I can't even tell from here either. This, maybe the fourth one from the front is a different one, I think. It's pretty close, right? Eventually, all the lights get changed except for one. And somebody says, hey, isn't that the original light? Isn't that the one we all like to start off with? Isn't that the one that made us all really happy? I'm comparing that to scripture now. I hope you're following it, right? Well, how are we going to fix that? We have to get back to the original. All the other ones have to disappear. I suppose that's God's cleansing power. Right? That would be the only way to get back. And you see what happens there in Kings is that once it is revealed that they had strayed so far away from the word of the law, there's only one solution. And it's not compromise. The only solution is we got to get 100% back to the word of the Lord. And that's the same today. That's the same today. Right? If you look at our nation and you say, wow, we used to be a Christian nation. What happened? Compromise. Really? That's what happened. Little by little by little, taking in a little bit of this, a little bit of that, they can do this, they can do that, etc., etc., etc. When you compromise, remember you're giving something up. 
So what has our nation given up? Following God. And then somebody might say, well, things are a mess. We have to get back to the Lord. And I agree with that 100%. But the secret there then is, you can't get back to the Lord by, okay, let's see, um, uh, we'll take back 25%. Or we'll go back 50%. That's still compromise. And God says, you can't compromise on my word. If you want to get to heaven, there's one way and only one. Right? We can't change that. Because that's what God said. And so as much as we might want to look at somebody, a family member, or somebody else who's a close friend, or maybe a spouse, or somebody else, right? And we might want to look at them and say, oh, there must be two ways. <coughs> And we might even say, please, Lord, make two ways. But unless God changes it, it's not changing. So there's no way that you can compromise on those things. We have to stand firm upon the word of the Lord and upon the rock. Okay? And in that way, we avoid the danger. Because I believe, and we see it in Scripture historically, wow, what a danger when they compromise on what God told them to do. It was a mess, and it was again a mess, and it was again a mess, and again. And in many ways, we're living in a mess today. And it's all because people have compromised on what the Lord says is right. So stand with me this evening. And as I said before, I need God's help. You might say, I don't need it. Well, that's what you need. But I'm telling you that I need God's help. I need God's help in my natural body, not to compromise. I need God's help in my spiritual walk with Him, not to compromise. Right? And Because all around me, there's pressure to do that. And the only way that we can stand true is to stand, well, to have the Lord within us. Right? His strength is what will help us not to fold under the pressure. And so tonight, as we close, let's pray. And you, and you pray for situations in your life, I'll pray for situations in mine, where we need to trust the Lord and believe, again, I say, that God knows what He's doing, and He, through it all, will make a way. And we, if we hold fast to Him, will be able to walk through whatever valley, whatever tumult, whatever it happens to be, right? And when people are down is often when the enemy comes trying to make a deal, compromise. And so it's important that we pray one for another and especially to remember those that are going through a trial and through a test, right? To hold them up and to ask the Lord to touch them. So we have that list. You know that list. It's in your mind. I won't repeat it all, but I'll add somebody to it. Don't know the whole situation. It may not be 100% accurate, but you'll notice, you may have noticed, Sister Webster wasn't here this morning, right? And Dan, as he was leaving this morning, mentioned that she did fall this week. And she may have hurt herself. Um, and slipped. She, well, she slipped. She didn't go down all the way. But she slipped and maybe pulled something, right? And he thought, that's probably why she wasn't at church this morning. Maybe that's not accurate, but she wasn't here. And we should always be praying one for another, right? So whether she needs a healing, or she needs encouragement, or she just needs God's protection, and to bring her out again next week, whatever. And that I pray, that's how you would pray for me, all right? It's not a judgmental thing, right? We're not saying, oh, she was bad, or this or that, or I was bad. No. We're just praying, Lord, you have your way. You lead, you guide, because we miss everybody in the family of God, right? And we want God to protect and care for each and every one. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I do thank you. Lord Jesus, sometimes, and I believe like tonight, really your, your lessons can be difficult or hard because we may be in a situation where we would love to just give a little. Just to 
overlook something. But God, you know, that verse that says, you know, if we know to do right and we don't know, don't do it, then that's sin. And that's pretty plain. And the Lord, you as a teacher, can be very, very plain and direct. And Father, I just stand before you tonight and you know my faults, and you know my failures, and you know that I am far, far from anything close to perfect, and how much I need you. And I'm grateful, Lord, that you help me. And I believe through a message like this tonight that you first gave to me, that, Lord, you're encouraging me to not compromise. You're encouraging me, you're telling me it's possible not to compromise. It's possible to walk and live a life holy and acceptable unto the Lord. Because, Lord, I, I can't truthfully say that anything short of perfect is good enough for you. So I'm always trying, I'm always striving, and I believe, Lord, as we are here standing this evening, we're doing the same thing. We're trying. We're trying. And there are times we make mistakes, big ones, and sometimes they're really big. But Lord, help us not to consciously give away any of the truth that we know of. Help us not to make a bargain or a deal with the devil. But Lord Jesus, help us to stay true to you. So God, as we pray this evening now, uh, we are going to remember all those that need a touch, many that we don't even know, they might need a touch. And God, help us not to forget them in the week that's coming up. But Lord, bring them to our remembrance that at the very least we would pray. Pray for them. And not in a judgmental way, but in a way, dear Lord God, that makes it clear that you know best. And you are going to work things out the way you know they have to be. And we have a privilege of being obedient and following your word without a doubt, without fear. And help us, Lord, without question, I pray in Jesus' name.